Hello gorgeous bookworms. <laughs> How are you all doing today? I hope you're well. And no, you don't have to be a bookworm to enjoy today's video. I hope not. Hope. I hope you enjoy anyway, whether you're a bookworm or not. We're definitely into reading season, aren't we? With chilly, dark nights. It's kind of blissful though, isn't it? Curled up on the sofa, quilt, book, mug of hot something or other. For me, it's peppermint tea. And for the last sort of three weeks or so, I'm a bit late in saying thank you, this gorgeous card from Susie arrived. Really lovely words. Thank you, sweetheart. Um, and chocolate. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been a case of sort of 11 o'clock in the evening, finish everything I'm doing, turn everything off apart from my little reading light, curl up, quilt, steaming mug of tea and two, I'm trying to limit it to two squares of chocolate as I read. Bliss. Right, so I've got a couple of books to share with you today and well, it's a real mixed bag today in terms of my response. So I'm going to start with Colin Thubron's To a Mountain in Tibet. Famous travel writer. I have read his a couple of his books before. I've read um, Amongst the Russians and In Siberia. His other ones include... Um, what's it the shadow of the silk road something about behind the wall china so they're kind of more eastern which has never really held my imagination apart from tibet so i haven't read his others and i came across this recently and i was i'd been reading a lot of rural stuff some rural coming up um natural history, that sort of thing. And I just fancied a complete change. So I saw this and I thought, oh, mountain in Tibet, mountain and Tibet, I'll grab it. He's a really rated writer. Uh, on the cover, just to digress straight away, it says there's a little, you know, a sort of um, a famous person says why you should read Colin Thubrun. It says, I would rather read Colin Thubrun than any other travel writer alive. Quote, by John Simpson. John Simpson, our, um, what do you call him? Um, journalist, reporter, TV journalist and reporter, often, often on the front line of, you know, some pretty hideous stuff around the world. I really like John Simpson. He used to be a customer of mine at my bookshop. I won't tell you what he used to read or what he used to buy because that's his own private thing, but quite eclectic taste really enjoyed it every time he came into the shop and actually he's written a book that I would highly highly recommend it's very out of date now <laughs> realize I'm talking about something from the 90s but John Simpson's book dispatches from the barricades it as he said himself it was pure coincidence really but he happened to be in all 10 um sort of eastern bloc countries um, as communism was falling in those countries so it's his his reports from those countries in that moment when whatever event happened that sparked the downfall of communism in that country absolutely fascinating read and i think so yeah it was all through the 90s wasn't it i think especially for younger people today if they're hearing about older people talking about communism, the Iron Curtain, the Eastern Bloc countries, uh, thinking, what's this all about? Buy them a copy of John Simpson's Dispatches from the Barricades to uh, perfectly encapsulates that astonishing period in recent history. Anyway, we're not here to talk about John Simpson, are we? We're here to talk about Colin Thibron. So the, the reason I was attracted to the book in the first place was because I used to be nuts about reading about mountaineering. There's a whole collection of books in my own library all about mountaineering. And inevitably, if one gets into mountaineering, reading about mountaineering, one almost certainly starts to read about Tibet because 
you know, the Himalayas. I was, as I was reading this book, for me it's almost like going back in time to a younger version of myself when I was reading all that sort of stuff and I was trying to remember, for me, which came first, mountaineering or reading about Tibet. And I think, I think the mountaineering came first and then I'd read the Heinrich Harrer account of, it's called The White Spider and it's his account of conquering the north face of the Eiger. Okay, set that aside. Heinrich Harrer also wrote the book Seven Years in Tibet about his time in Tibet, end of the war, going into the Chinese invasion. So, so yeah, for me it was a, a little bit like sort of going back in time and, and I was loving that. Um, there's a brief description at the beginning um, where he speculates on and why Tibet holds such a sort of a, a almost sort of magical, mystical place in Westerners' eyes, minds, hearts. And that again, that got me thinking, why, why was I so enthralled by this country that I've never seen, that I probably never will see? What, what is it that's so magical about it and and it is all that sort of mysticism spirituality there's so many sort of religions in a way which have got a bit of a a bit of a hand in that country so i liked that he went into that a little bit um essentially it's in a way it's a book of two halves or two thirds and a third and the first couple of thirds is all about him trekking to get to this mountain that's just inside Tibet. So he starts in Nepal. Obviously these days he has to get permission to go into Tibet. So that first section of the book, I'm gonna see if I can find, I marked a page I wanted to share, is all about the trek in, sort of through the jungle, through gorges, it's climbing and climbing, starting to get um, higher and higher. And it's, I mean, it's just beautiful. I'm going to read you a little bit. Um, where should we read to? So he says, <clears throat> There are familiar shrubs too. He's talking about the botany. Jasmine, syringa, or syringa, and a teeming species of viburnum have fringed our trek for two days and now spread their foliage in the clearings. Sometimes I have the illusion of walking through an a ruined English garden. Generations of botanists, after all, brought back the Himalaya to Europe, tenderly crated, and their specimens are all about us here. Sunlight opens the papery white flowers of rock roses and potentilla over the hillsides. I locate honeysuckle, mimosa, dogwood, and tortoiseshell butterflies are floating among faded buddleia. A wonky tin bridge spans the sal collar. The stream flows jade green like the canali, whose noise is hollow and far away now, bellowing in constricted chasms. It goes on. Goat herds. He can see some goat herds corralling their goats. So it's really sort of... There's a, the, the writing is quite lush almost. It's sort of lush like the landscape. And I did find myself sort of read a paragraph, a couple of sentences, whatever, and almost want to just stop reading and, and sort of feel that and take it in and sort of saturate myself in it. You know, sometimes read the paragraph again. Absolutely gorgeous. But yeah, it, it I think it pays to just take a moment to, to stop it and, and really take that in. So I really loved that, the sort of the trek in and various villages he stays in and he describes the people there, his host for the night, his surroundings where he's in a, a little cave of a house and what he's eating. Loved all that. But then he gets to the mountain and it's a it's a it's a pilgrimage site. So there are all sorts of people. They walk around the mountain as pilgrimage. And it's yeah, so it's sort of, it's very much, it's about pilgrimage, it's about faith, it's about sacrifice. He's dealing with his own demons while he's there. And 
I started to turn off. <laughs> so the whole, so that's why I mean for me it's a book of two two thirds and a third. The first two thirds, the track in, loved it, loved the descriptions, absolutely wallowed in them. But that last third, it gets a bit um, it gets a bit technical in places as well about all the different gods. So we're he's looking at sort of Hinduism and Buddhism and other religions which I can't remember the names of now or, or, or sort of factions of Hinduism and Buddhism so it's going sort of through all these gods and which god came first and it, it, it's one of those moments where it's, it gets a little bit list like and yeah it just suddenly cut me off I didn't feel I didn't feel I was there anymore I didn't feel engaged with it and it also had me reflecting that I stopped, I stopped reading mountaineering books, sort of mid 2000s, 2000s, I mean. Likewise, books on Tibet. And I think reading this sort of reminded me why. I think I was just saturated in it. I'd had enough. So it was really interesting for me to come back to sort of that region and that, that subject matter. And I did enjoy the trek, but I didn't enjoy the latter third when, when we got into sort of the religions and all the technicalities with that. And it just didn't, just didn't mean anything to me. I just didn't engage. So I did think to myself after I finished it, I thought, well, it kind of left me a bit hanging. And I, I by the end, I, right at the very end, as I closed the last page, I thought, so what? <laughs> which which isn't great, is it, at the end of a book? So what? Um, yeah, so I'm not going to give it a thumbs down per se. It's beautiful writing, it's well written. I just think for me as a subject, maybe I'm done. I, maybe I'm done with that subject. Hey, maybe I'm not. Maybe I need to come to it again in... in another 20 years maybe I'll have different thoughts in 20 years but for now yeah glad I read it it was a change from everything else I'd been reading but I was really glad to get to the end of it so I could start my book on the lighthouses which obviously you've now seen that um and you can you can tell now why when I was making the video about talking about the sea house um the shaken sea houses the lighthouses I was out of order and I said, I'm not supposed to be talking about this one yet. I've got two more to talk about, but I want to talk about this one now because it was so great. That's the reaction I want to have to a book, not my reaction to Colin Thubron. I will say, however, the previous books of his I've read, which are Amongst the Russians and I think it's simply called In Siberia, I really, really enjoyed. I just think... Yeah, I think maybe I'm done with Tibet for now. Right, so on to um, the book. I actually read it before, <laughs> before the mountain in Tibet. But I wanted to talk about it after that today because I don't want to finish on a mm, book. I want to finish on a book. I finally got round to reading. I found another copy. The Shepherd's Life by James Rebanks. So this is James Rebank's first book. I think it was 2018. Oh, crikey, it was 2015 in paperback in 2016. So I know, oops, it's been a really popular book. I know loads of you will have read this by now. Late to the party as usual. So this is his first book and I've already read his second book, which I've got a copy of in my shop at the moment, English Pastoral. Uh, I will see if I can, I've talked about this book in a video, I'll see if I can find a link to it to add to this video. If not, I'll find it at a later point. But I have talked about this book already and I loved it. Um, now, if you read English Pastoral and loved it, you might pick this up. For me, they were very different books in some ways. So, really brief synopsis, or in a nutshell, James Rebanks is a sheep farmer in the Lake District in the northwest of England. Beautiful part of the country which many people will be very familiar with. Um, 
the Lake District. So for those outside of the UK, uh, it's the area which spawned swallows and Amazons, Beatrix Potter, of course, and now the sheep farmer James Rebanks. So the second book, English Pastoral, um, in a way, it's in sort of three parts. It's all about his, his grandfather's methods of farming, his father's farming methods, and now his. And there's a slight reversion back to some of the old ways. So I knew that this book was more specifically about being a shepherd. But that was kind of all I knew to expect. Um, beautiful writing style. It's incredibly easy to read. It's so easy. It's very conversational. Uh, there were moments when it felt like, it sort of felt like, imagine, imagine you're halfway up a hill. It's a howling gale of a night that you see a light on. It's a pub. Brilliant. Let's go into the pub. There's a gorgeous roaring fire. Take your wet clothes off. Take your wet boots off. Put them in front of the fire. Get all snug. And one of your friends starts to tell you stories. And some of them are from 40 years ago. Some of them are from last week. It don't matter. It's that kind of lovely, cosy, just chatting by the fire at the pub, feeling safe. So, yeah, a lovely, lovely style. And he's... The, the, the book is laid out by the four seasons. Where do we start? I think we start in spring... Oh, sorry, we start in summer, actually. A spring would have made more sense, wouldn't it, with the lambing? Anyway, so we start in summer, it follows the four seasons. And I thought it was going to be specifically about what it's like to be a sheep farmer in the Lake District. And of course it is, but he pops back in time quite a bit. So one moment he's talking in today's terms, him on his farm doing his thing with his sheep. But then he pops back, he must be about 50-ish, I would have thought. He's sort of going back um, in his memories to the 70s when he was at his granddad's knee learning the art of shepherding. Sometimes it's about his dad. So it's more, in a way, it's, it's less about how to be a sheep farmer. It's it's his biography, really, his, his memoir sort of popping about from time to time. And also, in terms of style, let me see if I can find a page where it will give us a good example. Bear with me. Um, we pop backwards and forwards in time with, with no warning. And sometimes the memory is a really, really little one. It just pops in. So if you see the way the page is laid out, you see there's a little sort of a break in. So this is one chapter, but you'll see there's a little break in it. That's where it, one of his thoughts or memories pops to something else. Now, you might think that's quite disruptive to the flow of the read, but it's not. It just flows so naturally. And that's what I mean about it's that style of conversation where... And I do it myself in my videos. I'll be talking about something and then say, oh, and, you know, and when I was six, such and such a thing happened. But anyway, yes, back to yesterday in the garden, duh, duh, duh. Oh, in my grandparents' garden, it's, yeah, it's how we, a lot of us talk, isn't it? We hop backwards and forwards. Excuse me, I've got a, oh, no, Rob. Um, I really enjoyed that. There were, I've, I've marked the pages. What did I want to... What I, what I really enjoyed and what I really identified with is this really strong work ethic. Um, there's no safety net in life. You've got to get on. You've got to get it done. There's no one to ask. you just got to get on and do it yourself. Although there is that lovely sense of community amongst the Lakeland shepherds. There's also... There's a theme that runs through which... At first I thought, all right, James, don't be having a go at us lot. There is a little tiny element, but he deals with it really well, I think. That's a bit sort of us and them, town, country, farmers, visitors. And the reason I say I think he handles it really well is because, because as a reader, one could be offended 
but actually instead of being offended uh, it just provoked my thoughts so he's very much talking about his lake district and when I was saying about many of us know the lakes and will identify, you know, many folk will will go there over and over and over and over again for for holidays, for even for the day to do some walking. You know, we all feel in, it's it's familiar to so many of us, and we all feel a sense of almost of ownership of it. But there's a strand from him that's actually you don't you don't have any of that we own it the people who live here and work here and who have done for generations for century after century after century you're just a visitor you don't know what it's really like so that's what i mean you one might feel a bit like oh all right all right well i won't come anymore then see see your tourist industry go down the drain <laughs> but it but like i say he does it in a way that it just made me really think about how, you know, with with parts of the world, just because we go there every summer and we do feel really connected to place, how deep really is that connection if we don't, if we don't work there, if we don't work that land there, if we don't have our hands in the soil there, for example. Um, there's a little bit of there's a couple of moments where I think he's got a bit of a chip on his shoulder about being thick and he's clearly not but at the beginning when he's struggling at school because school doesn't interest him he doesn't care about school he wants to be out on the fell with his sheep um and every now and again there's a bit like I think that's that's something that runs throughout there are moments where you think oh have you got a chip on your shoulder James but you know what, maybe if he has, maybe he's got every right to. Yeah. Like I said, it's, a, it's an incredibly easy read. It's a flowing read. But for that, there are moments when I kind of went, oh, okay. That was a bit barbed. wasn't expecting that. But I liked it all. By the time I got to the end, I liked it the better for that. Because it's not idyllic. It's not mushy at all. I mean, I don't think we'd expect it to be. I think we'd expect it to be the harsh truth of, of actually what it's really like up there on the fells in all weathers. Um, but yeah, he's definitely got... There is, a, there is an element of every now and again, there's those little barbs that come through, which in the first, I don't know, 50-odd pages made me kind of go... Mm. But then I started to get used to it and then I quite liked them, these little barbs. So yeah, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, it's interesting to compare the two as English pastoral. So I was talking to someone recently and recommending them, but knowing her tastes and what she reads and, and likes, I think she'd prefer this over English pastoral because English pastoral to me is, I preferred English pastoral I mean, I really liked them both. I really, really liked them both. And I recommend both um, without a second thought. I think I preferred English pastoral just because... Why did I prefer it? I think it's because it's... It's sort of dealing with... Uh, a, it's a sort of a more general overview of farming and the state of farming right now. And the, and the thoughts that farmers are having to go through and changes farmers are having to make to, to stay viable. That really interests me. This is fun, especially some of the bits of, you know, school and on the school bus and him being a bit of a beggar when he was little, actually. So, yeah, if you see either of them around, I'm going to put this in the shop now as well. Um, but, yeah, if you see copies, if friends say, oh, I've just finished reading this, would you like to borrow it? Say, yes, please, and grab it. They are great for sort of, <laughs> my hands in my hoodie. I think they're great at this time of year to just curl up with, get lost in, have your hot mug of something, <laughs> have a couple of chips. Chairs, not chairs with chocolate, squares with chocolate. Oh, a whole chair made from chocolate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just curl up, get cosy, immerse yourself, lose yourself. You'd probably finish it in a couple of nights. Um, they are lovely, quick, easy reads, but really immersive and 
really thought provoking about about the people who work in these places that we love to go and visit and what life is really like good stuff all right lovelies quickie today <laughs> wrapped up all in the space of half an hour i think which might be a record for me um anyway yeah hope you enjoyed that there'll be more books to come soon no doubt i'm just looking over on my reading pile over there uh, i won't tell you what's coming next i'll share it with you when i've actually read it so until then i'll see you either back in the garden or doing something else indoors look after yourselves happy reading and happy book swapping and all that gorgeousness for this winter cheerio